I would now like to uh, introduce our next, our next guest from the Israeli Embassy, the Deputy Ambassador, Sharon Bali. Sharon is a veteran diplomat. She has served prior to arriving in London as the Ambassador to Ghana. She has also served as the head of the Economic Division in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And before that, she was also one of the leading uh, analysts in the Policy Research Division responsible for Syria, Lebanon and Turkey. And I also want to thank her on such a busy day with the, with the Prime Minister in town for making herself available today. Thank you very much. Well, the Israeli leader of the opposition, distinguished members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, it is a pleasure to be here at the closing of this special Balfour Declaration Conference. And I would like to begin by thanking the Jewish News and BICOM for all the good and hard work uh, in putting this symposium together. The Balfour Declaration's anniversary deserves consideration as much as it deserves celebration. Though I was unfortunately unable to join you for the full day due to the visit of my Prime Minister, I have no doubt that your speakers uh, have stimulated an important dialogue about Balfour's intentions and implications. Much has indeed been said about the meaning of this century-old declaration. Many have said that Balfour is a promise fulfilled. A Jewish national home does indeed exist in Israel. Today, almost 70 years after we regained our independence, the Jewish national home is strong. It is a place where we can defend ourselves by ourselves, and it is a miraculous land of opportunity, innovation, and potential. However, others have contended that Balfour was comprised of two promises, one fulfilled, another broken. Israel's detractors often quote one line in particular to support their argument. And I have no doubt that many of you have heard it. Nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. As a matter of fact, the promise of the existing non-Jewish communities has been upheld in Israel since the 14th of May 1948 in our Declaration of Independence. It guaranteed complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants irrespective of religion, race, or sex. Complete equality was promised, and complete equality was delivered. Today, Israel is the only country in the whole greater Middle East whose Arab population are truly free. They're free to vote, they're free to criticize the government, they're free to join trade unions, free to worship. This is a remarkable feat, and we Israelis are deeply proud of our diverse and democratic nation. So Balfour's second promise to the non-Jewish communities in Israel was in fact kept, and had the Palestinians accepted the British offer of statehood in 1937, or the UN's F offer of statehood in 1947, or chosen independence over intransigence in 1967, in 2000, in 2008, they would have their own state alongside Israel too. My prime minister is here in London this week. He continues to offer negotiations to the Palestinians without preconditions. The fact is, the government of Israel's door remains open to peace. But the peace my people so deeply crave can only be reached through direct negotiations, through an end to incitement and terror, through the recognition of Israel and its right to live in peace and security. 
The Palestinians have recently turned their attention to reconciling their rival political factions, Fatah and Hamas. Some have been eager to welcome this as progress, but I would urge caution. The truth is, we are yet to see the direction this reconciliation takes us in. A century on from Balfour, will the Palestinians again choose terror and extremism over dialogue and negotiations? Will Hamas really consider ending their campaign of bloodshed and bigotry against Israel? These important questions are yet to be answered. When we look beyond the conflict and examine Israel's relations across the region, today Israel is speaking with more Arab governments than ever before. This discussion has the potential to bring prospects to the table that could reshape Israel's regional relationships and its dialogue with the Palestinians. So this is a time fertile in potential, but we cannot secure harmony by skipping dialogue and rushing to hasty solutions. <clears throat> Indeed, unilateral and immediate Palestinian recognition would damage these small, fragile shoots of hope. It would be an irrevocable act that would do nothing to advance talks. Instead, stoking intransigence and de demotivating the Palestinians from any prospect of compromise. Moreover, it would strengthen the hand of the regional destabilizers. Iran, through its revolutionary guards, Shiite militias, and its satellite terror group, Hezbollah, is desperately seeking to gain hold in Syria. Southern Lebanon, is being increasingly overrun by Hezbollah, who have amassed a cachet of arms estimated by some to be in the region of 140,000. Iran itself is resurgent, maintaining the capability to covertly continue its quest for nuclear weapons, a quest that will succeed if the flawed Iranian nuclear deal is not swiftly re-examined. So the challenges these regional destabilizers pose are significant. They concern many of the Middle East's Arab countries, which go some way to explaining Israel's warming relations. And I believe they should concern Europe and the world's democratic nations as well. 100 years on from Balfour Declaration, I believe Britain can be proud. Proud because Balfour played an important part in my people's journey from statelessness to sovereignty. Proud because Balfour's role in the establishment of the Middle East only democracy that shares with the UK the values of freedom, tolerance, human rights, and pluralism. Proud because Israel today is prosperous last year enjoying five billion pounds in bilateral trade with the UK. This thriving trading relationship is creating jobs and prosperity in both our countries. But more than that, our governments cooperate on a whole variety of levels. And this cooperation, though some of it cannot be openly spoken of, is making our peoples safer and our countries more secure. This week's historic anniversary enables us to look forward and chart the next 100 years in our country's strong bilateral relations. And as a new global Britain looks to take advantage of new openings across the world, I trust its bond with Israel, the world's innovation nation, will grow stronger still. Indeed, that is why Israel is one of a handful of nations to hold an economic group with British government so that we can grasp the opportunities of tomorrow, opportunities in high tech, in research, entrepreneurship, in investment. So I'm confident in 
I have confidence in our shared future. And this week's celebration will undoubtedly prove that the people of Israel and Britain are confident in our shared future too. Thank you all very much.